Well, last week, as I was preparing to talk about communion and relating it to Passover on Resurrection Sunday, I ran into a, a question which I never really pondered a lot before, but uh, did you know that Passover was never specifically presented as an offering for sin? There was no, it was not a sin sacrifice, and yet it's such an important part of the crucifixion, the Passion Week, and all that I, I started digging into it. And uh, yes, there is a definite element of redemption there. The, the covering, the lamb had to die so that the firstborn son could live, but not a lot of mention about sin specifically. And it seemed to me like the Day of Atonement, which deals so strongly with the sin issue, that that would be the a day that it would have been more appropriate for Jesus to be crucified on that holiest day on the Jewish calendar, the, the Day of Atonement. But uh, instead, it seemed to be God's intention to, to to have Jesus fulfill the Passover feast, and that was the time of the crucifixion. Uh, all the Jewish feasts and offerings point towards Jesus and offer a glimpse of his work. Second, or Colossians chapter 2, 16 through 17 says, Therefore do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. So Jesus fulfilled Passover in a significant way at the uh, on the crucifixion weekend, uh, 1 Corinthians 5, 7 says, Passover, or, or says, for Christ, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. There's no doubt that there is representation and, and picturing of Jesus in the Passover lamb, and he fulfilled the things that were represented there. In Matthew 26, 17 through 18, it says, on the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? He replied, Go into the city to a certain man and tell him, The teacher says, My appointed time is near. I'm going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. The Passover was the appointed time for this significant uh, earth-shaking time in history, uh, Passover rather than the Day of Atonement. So let's go back and look at the Day of, Atone of Atonement, uh, uh, the holiest day on the Jewish calendar. It traces back to the dedication of the tabernacle in the wilderness. They had constructed the tabernacle, the glory of the Lord filled the place, the fire of God fell on the altar and consume the sacrifice. It was just magnificent. But we read in Leviticus 10.1, Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, took their censers, put fire in them, and had added incense, and they offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, contrary to his command. So fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Moses then said to Aaron, this is what the Lord spoke of when he said, Among those who approach me, I will be proved holy in the sight of all the people. I will be honored. And Aaron remained silent. So there is a way that we come before the Lord. We don't just do our own thing. We need to do it God's way. And that's the background for the Day of Atonement, which shows how do we approach God and how, did they, how could they come before him. So, six chapters later, Leviticus 16, 1. The Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the sons of Aaron who died when they approached the Lord. The Lord said to Moses, Tell your brother Aaron that he is not to come whenever he chooses into the most holy place behind the curtain in front of the atonement cover on the ark, or else he will die. For I will appear in the cloud over the atonement cover. The atonement cover, also called the mercy seat, was the solid gold hammered lid that went over the Ark of the Covenant with uh, cherubim angels uh, facing inward uh, toward it. Uh, and that's where God would meet at the mercy seat at this place 
where sins could be covered. And uh, it was uh, it was a very important, the center of the whole thing of the temple worship, the, the atonement cover, the mercy seat. And the word atonement means covering. The same word appears first in Genesis chapter 6. Noah was told, go make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch, inside and out. Coating it with pitch, covering it over so no water can get in. Uh, another example of, of this word in, in the atonement idea, the covering of sins. David asked the Gibeonites, what shall I do for you? How shall I make atonement so that you will bless the Lord's inheritance? There had been a, a Saul... David's predecessor did an ethnic cleansing type thing against the Gibeonites who Joshua had made a treaty with centuries before, and it resulted in uh, a curse on the land until they made it right. So he said, how do I make atonement? Uh, how do I make up for this? And the Day of Atonement was a day of covering of the sins of the people, and how could that happen? It has to do with with making up for wrong. and. Uh, so the atonement cover, the mercy seat, where the blood was sprinkled so that sins could be covered, that happened once a year. Uh, and uh, so we read in Leviticus 16, 3 and, and 6, This is how Aaron is to enter the most holy place. He must first bring a young bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. Aaron is to offer the bull for his own sin offering to make atonement for himself and his household. And Next verse says, Then he is to take two goats and present them before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting. He is to cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other for the scapegoat. Uh, he was told to sacrifice one goat along with the bull, and the smoke of incense was to cover the Ark of the Covenant so he would not die by seeing it and coming too close. And then then he was to sprinkle the blood of the bull and the goat, which was sacrificed on the atonement cover. And the, I encourage you to read Leviticus 16 for more of the details. I'm just touching some of the highlights, but there the blood was sprinkled between the cherubim. Uh, it's significant, I think, in regard to this, too, that when Jesus rose from the dead, there were two angels facing towards one at his head and one at his feet when Mary went into the tomb. The the Ark of Covering, the the uh, Ark of the Covenant, the Mercy Seat, which we have significantly portrayed here in the Day of Atonement. It just seemed like the Day of Atonement should be the day that Jesus would have been crucified. But uh, then the, the then he shall come out to the altar as before the Lord. He shall make atonement for it. He shall take some of the bull's blood and some of the goat's blood and put it on the altar uh, and on the horns of the altar. So after working inside the tent of the meeting, the holy place, the Ark of the Covenant and the sprinkling there, then he was to go out into the into the courtyard where the altar, where the sacrifices were made for the during the year then and to sanctify it, to sprinkle it. And uh, then when Aaron has finished making atonement for the most holy place, the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall bring forward the live goat. He shall lay both hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the wickedness and rebellion of the Israelites, all their sins, and put them on the goat's head. He shall send the goat away into the wilderness in the care of someone appointed to the task. That's Leviticus 16.21. And... The goat will carry on itself all their sins to a remote place, and the man shall release it into the wilderness. So here on the Day of Atonement, we have sacrifice and blood shed and sprinkled for the cleansing of sin, and the scapegoat carrying on itself all their sins outside the city. Jesus, our scapegoat, was crucified outside the city gates. So why not the Day of Atonement for the crucifixion? And we also read Leviticus 23, 28. It says, Do not do any work on that day, because it is the day of atonement, when atonement is made for you before the Lord your God. Those who do not deny themselves on that day must be cut off from their people. 
I will destroy from among their people anyone who does any work on that day. You shall do no work at all. This is to be a lasting ordinance for the generations to come wherever you live. Uh, so this atonement is made for you. You don't make it yourself. You can't make up for your wrongs. God has provided a way of covering of the sins, uh, the atonement, the covering over those sins. Uh, and, and there's stu still no work allowed in Israel to this day. On the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, the holiest day, it's the, the day like in the Christian world where people only attend church on, on Easter or Christmas. So that's kind of how it is there, but it's widely recognized. Uh, uh, they, they completely suspend everyday uh, traffic and normal broadcasting uh, over the airwaves. And uh, it's the highest holy day on Jewish calendar. It's also Israel's greatest moment of vulnerability. If you may recall the Yom Kippur War, the Arabs chose to take advantage of this feature by attacking Israel on that day. And they really had to rally around and, uh, and uh, come together to defend themselves uh, because they were attacked at a day of no work, no activity that was allowed. Of course, they were, it was an opportunity where they had to do that anyhow, but, uh, but not working for our salvation. It makes us vulnerable. We have to trust in God instead of in ourselves. Uh, we can't work our way into God's favor, but just simply accept his provision, which is the blood that was shed. So you want to try to fix things yourself. You, you know, your unrighteousness and problems, let me handle this. Well, the Bible says they needed to deny themselves, which meant they need to perish the thought that they could, they could make themselves holy, that they could be righteous by doing their own good works. Don't even think about it. No work allowed on the Day of, Atone of Atonement. Uh, you know, think of a toddler trying to change their own messy diaper. Uh, it doesn't work, and we can never clean ourselves up, but he can. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. You can't work your way into heaven. You can't work your way into God's favor. And on the Day of Atonement, they couldn't work their way into God's favor either. They had to just do no work and trust in the sacrifice that was being offered in obedience and faith to what God had directed them. Uh, nobody can boast. We can't save ourselves. Jesus suffered through the mocking and the scourging for us. He hung for six hours of agony on the cross. And when he finally declared, it is finished, there was no more for us to do. Nothing more for him to do either. Hebrews 9.12, he did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. Hebrews 10, 12, But when this high priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Uh, and he, the work was done. The priests in the temple, they had to stand and minister year after year and day after day. But Jesus completed. He sat down at the right hand of God. And not only that, but he, he didn't just cover the sins, if they're covered, they're still there. They're not in the way, not interfering with the relationship with God, but they're still there. The Old Testament never says that those sacrifices took away the sins. They were just covered. Hebrews 10.4 says, It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Hebrews 10.11, Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. The Day of Atonement, the Day of Covering of Sins, it was, it was completed, it was fulfilled in Jesus when he came and didn't just cover the sins, but he took them away. Uh, John one twenty nine. The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 1 John 3.5 But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins. 
and in him is no sin. That's my prayer for people that are, uh, are in need of Jesus, that, that he would appear to them, that they could see he appeared so that he might take away our sins. And so that holiest day on the Jewish calendar, not on the Christian calendar, on the Jewish calendar, the Day of Atonement was the holiest day. But uh, what could be more appropriate? Well, Passover. And so let's take a look at that. It all goes back to the time of the Exodus and new beginnings, leaving Egypt. Exodus 12, verse 1 and 2, The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, This month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. Now the month of, of the Day of Atonement, that was the first day of the uh, of, of the civil year, the perhaps agricultural year, but the, the day on the religious calendar began here in the month that the Passover began. It was a time of new beginnings when they left Egypt. And uh, in our lives, Passover, the time of new life and escape from slavery uh, to sin and to Satan and everything else, uh, that's the time that was chosen for the crucifixion and the resurrection. Verse 3 of chapter 12, Exodus, Take the whole community of Israel, uh, tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. I'm beginning to see that maybe the Passover was chosen as the day that Jesus was crucified because, as we'll read the story of the Passover, it brings everything so close to home. It's not just a off behind a curtain in a in a temple or a tabernacle somewhere. It's not just uh, off at, at some other location, but it's, it brings it right to my home, to my family, to my household. Uh, it's not just a sacrifice for the whole nation. It's a sacrifice that's going to affect and impact, impact me uh, personally. And so the first Passover, it was, uh, it was something that they each took a lamb, each man a, a lamb for his family. Uh, and if any household is too small for a whole lamb, verse 4 says, they must share one with their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. You are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. The, the uh, Day of Atonement, that's a great day of personal introspection and soul searching. There are 10 days leading up to that. The, the uh, Feast of Trumpets, Rosh Hashanah, and the the days of awe, as they are called, when you're contemplating your own life and reevaluating, getting ready for the Day of Atonement when the blood is going to be sprinkled. Uh, uh, but it's very personal. But this this Passover is the thing where you look around you and say, is there somebody else that needs something? Do I need something? Can I get help from somebody else? Uh, my household is too small, we can't eat the whole lamb, maybe we can find somebody else, or does somebody else need a lamb? And uh, so, to me, that's a, another of the beauties of Passover. It causes you to look beyond your own tight-knit little circle. Verse 5 says, The animals you choose must be year-old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. It could be a little lamb, or it could be... Uh, it could be a, a little kid goat. Uh, it's going to be an innocent little creature, cute as can be. Uh, instruction was taken on the 10th day of the month and keep it until the 14th. Nowhere else are they told to care for a, a sacrificial animal in this way. Why? I think because it puts the family in connection with the sacrifice. Keep it for four days. Play with it. Feed it. Hold it. Love it. Bond with it. Uh, we, we remember the story of David being confronted by Nathan and then the story of the lamb there that reads like this in Second Samuel chapter 12, 1 through 3. The Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, There were two men in a certain town, one rich and one poor. The rich man had a very large number of, number of cattle and sheep, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it, and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Uh, you see, 
I think God wanted this to be more than just a business transaction. There could be a, a, an animal taken from the flock or herd with no emotional attachment. And it's taken place off there. Uh, no time spent with it. No holding it and, and loving it and watching it. Uh, uh, it was kind of a business transaction. Uh, uh, you know, somebody, even if on the in the Passover lamb, if they had a large herd, they could just grab one that might, uh, they figure, well, this one do, it looks pretty good. And uh, maybe they might choose one with the least economic impact on their herd and all other things being considered, uh, probably not one that they had any emotional attachment to. But but uh, even if you needed to purchase a lamb in the Passover the time of, of Jesus, uh, in uh, a time near that, there was Josephus, the historian, said there were 250,000 lambs sacrificed in one day on a Passover. Uh, it may have been that the shepherds that watched the flocks by night when Jesus was born were raising lambs for the Passover celebration. Uh, but uh, even if you had to purchase a lamb, you couldn't just buy it and then send it away to be sacrificed. Uh, you uh, you had to spend time with it, four days. Uh, and there was a great potential for emotional attachment. I had kind of a uh, an epiphany, a revelation that came out of this when I hear Jesus described as the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. It doesn't just say a lamb, it just doesn't say grab from the flock at random. Uh, it doesn't just say uh, a creature which uh, I don't have any attachment to, but it was the Lamb of God, that, that which was precious. Uh, I think that may be part of the reason why Passover was chosen as the time of the crucifixion. It de describes the heart of God, and for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, his only begotten, not that he had a a, a large flock that he had any others, his only, the only, the one and only, the unique one. And and so I uh, would like to, if we can work it in here, I took a video of some kids from our church one resurrection weekend. We went out to a place where there were some newborn baby goats. Uh, goats were allowed, and when it says a year old, that means up to a year old. It could have been anywhere between the age of eight days, which... Uh, a uh, newborn lamb or, or a kid goat was required to stay with its mother for a week, and then it could be. But, uh, but let's just take a look and imagine what it would have been like for this family to take this animal and bond with it for those days. So take this cute little animal for four days and then the terrible news in verse 6. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. So you cuddle it and then you kill it. You slaughter it, slit its throat. That shocks our sensibilities. We recoil at the, at the thought that it graphically impresses upon us the terrible cost of redemption. Wages of sin is death. They came face to face with it each time for, for me to live, something has to die. For us to be shielded from the righteous wrath of God, somebody had to die 
and absorb that wrath in our place. So thankfully we don't have to go through the traumatic process of animal sacrifice every time we fail. But it might, might make us more appreciative of the seriousness of sin if we did. Another unique element of the Passover sacrifice was that the animal was not handed over to a priest. It was slaughtered there by the family in their own yard. Passover made it personal. Then they took, in verse 7 it says, Then you are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. So then you catch its blood. The blood that's shed is precious. It's essential. It's what I need. It's all I need. They didn't post a list of their good deeds on their doorposts. They just sprinkled the blood. They didn't strategize how are we going to defend ourselves against this uh, supernatural foe. They just sprinkled the blood. Verse 12 says, On that same night I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both men and animals. I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. Look at today, the gods of America. Industry, idolatry is rampant in sports, entertainment, immorality, material wealth, as it was in the days of Noah. And some, someday the wrath of God is going to be unleashed, and perhaps we're seeing it even now, as it was in the days of Noah. Verse 13 says, The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. What a marvelous picture of the work accomplished on the cross. And I want to share one other distinctive of the Passover. On the Day of, to of Atonement, there's no recorded uh, incident where God did not accept them. He responded to their sacrifices and blood that was sprinkled and uh, retained the covenant with them. There was no example of what happens if the wrath of God falls. Big sigh of relief for some. Phew, we got that out of the way and back to business for another year. Others, hopefully that 10 days of awe and seeking God and, and drawing near to him, it gave them encouragement to walk on with God. But in Egypt, it was a different story. Verse 29 of Exodus 12, at midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn of Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on the throne to the firstborn of the prisoner who was in the dungeon and the firstborn of all the livestock as well. So midnight is coming. Are you ready? Pharaoh didn't seek to hear from the Lord, the God of the Hebrew nation. He didn't even listen to his own counselors who told him, let him go, they're ruining Egypt. But he pursued his, pursued his own blind course. In Egypt, the Pharaohs were considered gods, and he thought that he was, uh, he was somebody great. <clears throat> The original lie of Satan is that you will be as God. You can establish your order. You figure things out. You, you make your own destiny. Pharaoh probably thought, I'm the ruler. I'm sovereign. If he would have humbled himself and sprinkled the blood over the doorposts of the palace, his son would have lived. But Pharaoh didn't care to hear. He thought he didn't need the covering of the blood. He just kept hardening his heart, and the outcome was tragic. John Chapter 3 doesn't end with verse 16, God so loved the world. There's a verse later in verse 36 that says something we need to listen to. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. So Passover reveals what happens when we don't believe, when we don't respond. The people of Israel that night, they trusted in the Lord with all their heart. They leaned not on their own understanding and acknowledged him. And uh, they simply acted in faith on God's instruction. And they and their firstborn sons marched out of slave land and headed towards the promised land that night. So both 
days are days of redemption, the day of atonement, the Passover. Each one reveals God's provision to reconcile lost people to himself. But maybe God has sent his only son to die on Passover because it brings the story home to me. It's not a distant, remote ritual, but it's up close and personal. So I want to thank you, God, for sending your son for me. I'm like the firstborn child in Egypt. I embrace your provision. I don't understand, but I believe. I've done nothing to deserve it, but I receive. I sprinkle your blood on the doorposts of my heart. I choose to follow you out of Egypt and into the promised land. Amen.